you. Uh, will you start the recording? Thank you. Great. It's recording. Wonderful. Uh, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see everyone and many people are still joining. So I will talk slowly. I will see that all of you are here, that no one will miss uh, the actual uh, webinar of uh, Professor Zachary Kaufman. So let me uh, introduce myself. My name is Tali Nates. I am the director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And together with our team, I'm June Tuli, uh, our education officer, and many others that are letting you in as we speak, we welcome you to tonight's webinar. It is wonderful to see uh, many friends from all around the world, some colleagues uh, from museums all around the world, in Israel, in the United States, colleagues uh, from Europe, colleagues from Asia, from Myanmar, from Kenya, from Somalia, from Rwanda, uh, from our own continent. Uh, we have friends from the Philippines, we have friends from Australia, uh, the UK, and of course, the United States. Uh, we have friends from Poland, the Netherlands, and Germany. It is wonderful also to welcome our colleagues and friends from the three Holocaust and Genocide Centers in South Africa. Uh, from the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center, we have uh, the director, Mary Klug, joining us, and many colleagues from the three centers, from Cape Town, Durban, and Johannesburg. Also, board members, members, and many supporters. And thank you to all of you for supporting us through the lockdown, through our weekly webinars, and through our programs. The excellent news is that the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center is going to slowly and cautiously reopen on the 1st of September next week. Uh, we will welcome limited numbers, very safely, masks on, physical distancing, sanitizing and so on, but at least we will be able to welcome you to see our exhibitions, to see our resource center, and to, to engage with us uh, on these very important topics of Holocaust and Genocide Studies. The Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center explores the history of genocides in the 20th century. And we start actually the journey uh, with the genocide against the Herero and Nama in our neighboring country, Namibia. But we focus our attention on two case studies, the Holocaust, and the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. And uh, those case studies open to look at many other case studies, including current 21st century case studies, such as the one in Myanmar. We explore the connections between genocide and contemporary human rights violations. And we urge our visitors to reflect on the consequences of prejudice, discrimination, racism, and othering. Today's talk, Lessons for Today from the Genocide Against the Tutsi in Rwanda, by our longtime friend and colleague, Professor Zachary Kaufman, an expert on genocide, will look at the genocide, but also at those connections. Professor Kaufman will concentrate on 10 lessons we should learn from Rwanda to prevent further bloodshed and build more uh, repre a, a representative societies. Let me now introduce Professor Kaufman officially to you. Professor Zachary Kaufman is Associate Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of Houston Law Center. Immediately before, he taught at Stanford Law School as a lecturer and was a senior fellow at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. And previously, uh, he also held academic appointments at Yale Law School, Harvard Law School, Stanford University, and New York University, and taught at Yale University's Department of Political Science and George Washington University's 
Elliott School of International Affairs. Professor Kaufman published many books, chapters, and articles. The list is just too long to mention tonight. But he is currently working on his fourth book on the law and politics of bystanders and upstanders, a subject, subject that we at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center are very, very interested in as we teach the case studies through the power of choices. Professor Kaufman has received, uh, uh, has served in all three uh, branches of the US government and in three war crimes tribunals, including the UN International Cr Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in Arusha. A member of both the International Association of Genocide Scholars and the International Network of Genocide Scholars that also the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center is a member of. Professor Kaufman dedicates a significant portion of his time to nonprofit organizations and social enterprises, particularly in Rwanda. And maybe allow me to mention just one. From 2001 to 2015, he was the founder, president and chair of the board of directors of the American Friends of the Kigali Public Library. This new and absolutely beautiful institute that I actually visited this year, uh, the beginning of this year, now serves as Rwanda's national public library and focal point for the country's annual Rwanda Reads campaign. Thank you so much, Professor Kaufman, for joining us. I look so much forward to learning from you. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much uh, to Madhu and to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Tali Nates for such a generous, warm welcome. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Thank you also to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center for hosting this event. As we couldn't be together in person, uh, my background is a photo uh, of the center. Marcosi, which means thank you in Rwanda's indigenous language, Kenya Rwanda, for having me here today. A special welcome and maraho, hello, to my Rwandan friends and friends of Rwanda who are with us here today. It's a profound honor to speak to you as we bear witness to and commemorate the 25th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda last year. I was also privileged to visit Rwanda last year to speak at the official commemoration conference in Kigali and to participate in other commemoration activities there and throughout the United States and Canada since. I'm sorry that the coronavirus prevents us all from being together in person. I hope you and your families are staying healthy and safe. It would have been wonderful to visit Johannesburg again for this event as my family has deep roots in South Africa. My mother was born and grew up in Bloemfontein. I visited South Africa, including Johannesburg several times for both professional and personal reasons. Most recently, my wife Elizabeth and I had the most magnificent honeymoon traveling throughout South Africa. Before we, be we begin, as we will be discussing genocide, I want to warn you of the troubling content, both visual and descriptive, that will follow. Also, I'd like to note that as some of my own relatives were killed during a genocide, the Holocaust, I sympathize with the overwhelming pain and, ir and, ir and irreplaceable loss many Rwandan friends must feel. In the over 20 years, half my life, I have been visiting Rwanda, first as a practitioner working on the investigation and prosecution of genocidaire, genocide perpetrators, and more recently as an academic, I have focused on listening. It has been the honor of my life to be allowed by Rwandans to learn from them and, from them, and for them to share with me their losses and hopes. Last year marked the 25th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. 
During 100 days in 1994, Hutu extremists slaughtered over 1 million people, primarily Tutsi, as well as Hutu and others who opposed the genocide. With a murder rate that some commentators estimate to have been three to five times faster than that of the Holocaust, the genocide against the Tutsi has been characterized as the most efficient mass killing since the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or indeed at any time in the 20th century. While our discussion will focus on Rwanda, other atrocity crimes are raging today. Most recently, just last October, Genocide Watch, an organization on whose advisory board I am honored to serve, issued a genocide warning about the northeastern part of Syria. In that area, Turkey launched an incursion targeting Kurds. Some of my colleagues and I are concerned that the attacks, because they targeted Kurds deliberately for no other reason than because of their ethnicity, carried genocidal undertones. Just last week, I joined 32 of my colleagues in law and human rights in sending a letter to the US Secretary of State advocating for the US Department of State to make a public determination that genocide has been committed against the Rohingya population of Myanmar. And I know that we have at least one person joining us today from Myanmar, and so a special welcome to you. Learning from the genocide against the Tutsi provides crucial insight into averting conflict and fostering more inclusive communities. The current era of deep political, racial, class, and gender division, as well as ongoing atrocity crimes, compel reflection. Today, I'm going to share lessons from the hell of those 100 days in 1994. 10 lessons from Rwanda are especially pertinent to preventing further bloodshed and building more representative societies. The international com community not only should, but must learn from Rwanda's experience before, during, and after the genocide against the Tutsi. Some of the lessons I'll share will mention the country in which I live, the United States, but they are no less relevant to South Africa and other countries. The 10 lessons I'll discuss today are first, hate speech is dangerous. Second, atrocity prevention is possible. Third, transitional justice is essential. And transitional justice refers to the processes and objectives of societies addressing past or ongoing atrocity crimes and other serious human rights violations through judicial and non-judicial mechanisms. The tools available to those seeking and implementing transitional justice are numerous and varied, including prosecution, amnesty, lustration, exile, indefinite detention, lethal force, and as made famous by South Africa's approach to addressing apartheid, truth commissions. Transitional justice is highly context dependent. The fourth lesson is that sexual abuse is rampant. Fifth, women's representation is crucial. Sixth, genocide education is necessary. Seventh, political will is vital. Eighth, supporting survivors is fundamental. Ninth, upstanderism is imperative. Tenth and finally, never again is an unfulfilled platitude uttered again and again. I'll discuss the first three lessons in more detail than the remaining seven. The first lesson is that hate speech, including state-sanctioned bigotry, is dangerous. In the years leading up to the genocide against the Tutsi, Hutu extremists monopolized and manipulated local media to differentiate, dehumanize, and demonize Tutsi. Such propaganda characterizing Tutsi as Inyinzi, cockroaches, Nzoka, snakes, and Ibizu, traitors, mobilized hundreds of thousands of other Hutu who felt compelled to attack Tutsi. The newspaper Kangura, meaning Wake Others Up in Kinyarwanda, and other periodicals, as well as radio television Libre de Mil RTLM, also known as Hate Radio, and Radio Rwanda, were voices of extremism. Not only did these media outlets spew virulent anti-Tutsi propaganda that incited the genocide, but they also distributed specific instructions that directly helped execute those atrocities. 
Even years before the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994, Kungura and other prominent newspapers and journals in Rwanda began pr printing articles and illustrations that were unapologetically and unambiguously anti-Tutsi. Some examples. Kangura falsely asserted the following, often projecting onto Tutsi exactly the preparations and acts of Hutu genocidaire. That Tutsi infiltrated and disproportionately occupied, if not dominated, positions of economic, social, political, and religious influence in Rwanda. That Tutsi militia members admitted that they had come to clean the country of the filth of Hutu that Tutsi resemble Nazis in their ideology and even adopted the Nazi swastika as their emblem, that Tutsi are cannibals, that Tutsi women were devious and deadly seductresses of Hutu men, and that Tutsi were planning a genocidal war on Hutu that would leave no survivors. Perhaps the most famous example of Kungura's incitement is its cover from December 1993, four months before the genocide erupted. That cover reproduced on this slide contains four elements. First, a photo of Gregoire Kayabanda, a former president of Rwanda who promoted Hutu majority power. A sarcastic headline referring to Tutsi as the race of God. The following question, what weapons can be used to finally defeat the Inyinzi, meaning cockroaches, one of many derogatory words used against Tutsi. And as if to offer an answer to that question, a picture of a machete, one of the primary weapons that would soon be used to perpetrate the genocide. Radio was an even more effective means of communication than print media because of the relatively low literacy rate in Rwanda. There is a traditional and popular oral culture in Rwanda. Many Rwandans owned radios, and the government reportedly distributed free radios before and possibly even during the genocide. Radio Rwanda, the national radio, was used as a mouthpiece of the government. It sometimes broadcasted inaccurate information. Because Rwandans had little access to independent media sources, the veracity of these claims was left unchecked. For example, in 1992, Radio Rwanda falsely declared that Tutsi were planning to kill certain Hutu leaders. Some suspect Radio Rwanda intended to encourage Hutu to slaughter Tutsi preemptively, which Hutu began doing the following day. RTLM, Radio Television Libre de Mioclonin, Hate Radio, was established in 1993 by pro-Hutu forces and began broadcasting later that year. One of the RTLM founders was Simon Bikindi, a popular musician famous for his anti-Tutsi songs. The lyrics of one song included in reference to Tutsi, remember this evil that should be driven as far away as possible so that it never returns to Rwanda. RTLM began, uh, became popular among Hutu because it played lively music, showcased gossip, and reported supposed news that was often untrue and interviews that were often inaccurate. Before April 6, 1994, when the genocide in Rwanda erupted, RTLM actively incited the, the atrocities. The following are portions of RTLM broadcasts. They, Tutsi, look like animals. Actually, they are animals. The Tutsi cockroaches are bloodthirsty murderers. They dissect their victims, extracting their vital organs, heart, liver, and stomach. They are man-eating cockroaches. The Tutsi cockroaches are ferocious beasts the most vicious of hyenas, more cunning than the rhino. The Tutsis have always been evil. They may smile and wink, but they will take your children away. We can't let them, Tutsi, attack our country. I'm asking everybody to stand up and fight using everything you have. We must take sticks, clubs, and machetes and stop them from destroying our country. RTLM exploited tension between ethnic groups to promote or reaffirm Hutu fears that Tutsi were threatening and would not peacefully share power. On April 6, 1994, when the plane carrying the Rwandan president, Juvenel Habiriyamana, a Hutu, was shot down, RTLM blamed the Rwandan Patriotic Front, a Tutsi group, despite the fact that the culprit is still unknown. RTLM broadcasted, the cockroach's cruelty is irreversible. The only remedy is total extermination. Kill them all, totally wipe them out. These are the co-founders of RTLM, Jean Bosco Braguiza and Ferdinand Nahimana, 
and the founder of Kungura, Hassan Ngeze. Beyond inciting the genocide, these and other media figures were instrumental in orchestrating the atrocities. After the genocide erupted, radio became even more important as a source of information and analysis for Rwandans than before the genocide, since the conflict inhibited travel and access to outside media. Officials of the, inter of the interim government told Rwandans to listen to radio broadcasts. RTLM urged Hutu to kill Tutsi. For example, RTLM broadcast, the graves are not yet full. Who is going to do the good work and help us fill them completely? RTLM directed listeners to construct roadblocks and search for Tutsi generally and specifically named individual people and areas that should be targeted. Radio Rwanda, the national radio station, aired similar instructions and information. Free speech is, of course, essential to an open society. However, we must, we should recognize that there must be limits. And those limits must apply not only to the print and broadcast media that was so crucial to inciting and orchestrating past genocides, including the Holocaust and the genocide against the Tutsi, but also to social media in today's world. About two years ago, Facebook acknowledged that it had been used to incite violence in Myanmar against the Rohingya population, violence that many, including me, have, subsequent, have subsequently characterized as genocide. Social media, including Facebook, must do a better job enforcing its own code of conduct and engaging with civil society to combat hate speech and disinformation. Concerns about hate speech relate not only to foreign countries, but also to my own country, the United States. Commentators today accuse both conservatives and liberals in the United States of employing discriminatory discourse, some of this language even resembling such genocidal propaganda. Most notably, critics of President Donald Trump's rhetoric and conduct often describe them as exemplifying racism, xenophobia, sexism, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism. Like Hutu extremists and Nazis and other fanatics before them, President Trump has even referred to undocumented immigrants and his political opponents as non-human enemies. His words and deeds are blamed for inciting violence, perhaps deliberately so, Clashes among citizens have indeed followed. In just the first year after his election, reported hate crime in the United States spiked 17%. In counties that hosted his 2016 camp campaign rallies, hate crime accounts skyrocketed 226% in subsequent months compared to similar counties that did not host such events. Political scientists, legal scholars, and other commentators have found strong correlations between President Trump's incendiary language and violence that has ensued. The hate speech that incited the genocide against the Tutsi should remind Americans, South Africans, and all people throughout the world, especially elected officials and other leaders, to scrupulously avoid inflaming tensions, amplifying hatred, or emboldening attacks. A second lesson is that atrocity prevention is possible. Genocide and other atrocity crimes can be stopped and even averted in the first place. Historians have documented how the United Nations and countries such as the United States, France, and Belgium were aware of the genocide, contrary to their declarations of ignorance, and yet declined to respond effectively. If the, United, if the United Nations had even modestly bolstered its peacekeeper, pre, peacekeeper presence already in the country, which was led by this man, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, it would likely have deterred or mitigated the widespread systematic violence. Genocide and other atrocity crimes continue to rage around the world even today, from Syria here on the left in South Sudan to Yemen, a famine victim of which is on the right, and Myanmar. A bipartisan report in 2008 by former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, a Democrat, and U.S. Secretary of Defense William Cohen, a Republican, concluded that such offenses are preventable. The Albright-Cohen report argued that atrocity crimes threaten not only our values, but also our interests, because they cause refugee and regional crises. These findings spurred passage of two new bipartisan U.S. laws on atrocity prevention and response. 
in 2016 to 2017, while I was le on leave from academia to serve on the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee staff, I was honored to be a lead architect of both of these new laws. The Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act became law on January 14, 2019, and the Syrian War Crimes Accountability Act became law on August 13, 2018, when it was incorporated into the National Defense Authorization Act. I'll provide an overview uh, just briefly of both laws. Through four measures, the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act aims to, quote, prevent acts of genocide and other atrocity crimes, which threaten national and international security by enhancing U United States government capacities to prevent, mitigate, and respond to such crises. First, the law declares the sense of Congress that the US government's efforts at atrocity prevention and response through interagency coordination are critically important and suggests that appropriate US officials cooperate through holding meetings, identifying gaps in US foreign policy, facilitating policy, providing recommendations to the president and Congress, conducting outreach with civil society and dedicating resources. Second, the law states that the US government's policy is to regard the prevention of atrocities as in its national interest to work with partners and allies to identify, prevent, and respond to the causes of atrocities, and to pursue a US government-wide strategy to identify, prevent, and respond to the risk of atrocities. Third, the law adds training for foreign service officers on an atrocity crime anticipation, prevention, and response. In fact, the US Department of State, in conjunction with the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities, delivered the first ever regional atrocity prevention training recently in South Africa for personnel from 28 US embassies across Africa. Finally, the law mandates that the president transmit to Congress reports about atrocity prevention and response. The law directs the reports to include a detailed description of US efforts to prevent and respond to atrocities, recommendations to ensure shared responsibility by international and regional organizations, the implementation status, status of such recommendations contained in the previous report, and identification of organizations inside and outside the US government that were consulted in preparing the report. Given that atrocity prevention is achievable, the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocity Prevention Act's laudable rhetoric should finally become reality. Through five measures, the Syrian War Crimes Accountability Act requires a report on and to authorize technical assistance for accountability for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide in Syria. First, the law requires US Secretary of State to, re to report on the feasibility and desirability of potential transitional justice mechanisms in Syria. Second, the law requires the US Secretary of State to submit two reports to Congress. One is a report on atrocity crimes in Syria, including a summary and assessment of US government programs to ensure, accountab ensure accountability. And the other is a report on the US Department of State's study of transitional justice options for Syria. Third, the law authorizes the US Secretary of State to provide technical assistance to support accountability and transitional justice for Syria. Fourth, the law amends the US Department of State's rewards for justice program to explicitly reference Syria. This program offers money in exchange for information leading to the apprehension of suspected atrocity perpetrators. Finally, the law encourages the US Secretary of State to use the US government's influence at the United Nations to advocate that the UN Human Rights Council annually extend the mandate of its commission of inquiry on Syria. The Elie Wiesel and Syrian accountability laws hold great significance. Among other lofty, laudable implications, these laws recognize and codify atrocity prevention as in the US national interest. Not until passage of the Elie Wiesel Act did the legislative branch and federal law characterize the US government's commitment to atrocity prevention as a legal duty. The Elie Wiesel and Syrian accountability laws also represent the mainstreaming in US policymaking of atrocity prevention and transitional justice. Both laws define transitional justice, the first time the term was explained in US law. For the first time, the Elie Wiesel Act refers to the White House's Atrocities Prevention Board or its successor in a non-appropriations law. 
giving this interagency body greater congressional support and legitimacy. The Atrocities Prevention Board was established during the Obama administration. After initial fears that the Trump administration would abolish the body, the administration decided to retain but rebrand it the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force. This change in nomenclature, in nomenclature is meant to manage expectations that the body will actually prevent atrocities. The Elie Wiesel and Syrian accountability laws both seek to promote domestic and international cooperation on atrocity prevention in various ways. The Elie Wiesel and Syrian accountability laws both received overwhelming bipartisan support in Congress and from the president. This support demonstrates that Americans who are deeply divided on many topics can still agree on some basic principles. Furthermore, such bipartisan endorsement of both laws echoes the bipartisan nature of both the Proxmire Act, which was the US law that implemented the Genocide Convention, and the aforementioned Albright-Cohen Report. The US government's support for particular transitional justice options has fluctuated dramatically over time and context and has included the general options of and specific variations on inaction, lustration, which means purging from government, amnesty, exile, indefinite detention, lethal force, and prosecution. The Elie Wiesel and Syrian Accountability Act indicate the US government's current preference for prosecution. That said, the Syrian Accountability Act expresses the US government's continuing aversion to the International Criminal Court even in the remote possibility it could be used to prosecute atrocity crimes in Syria. The Elie Wiesel and Syrian accountability laws are, pr are prompting similar legislation in other countries. The United Kingdom was the first state to invoke the Elie Wiesel Act in considering enacting a comparable bill. A third lesson is that transitional justice is essential. The genocide against the Tutsi in 1994 was only the most recent in a series of atrocity crimes that Rwanda had suffered over the prior half century. Impunity for those earliest, smaller scale of offenses contributed to the massive conflagration later. Even while the genocide surged, questions arose about the most appropriate and effective means of eventually holding its suspected perpetrators accountable. Four major transitional justice mechanisms, all prosecutorial, were implemented to address the genocide against the Tutsi. Foreign actors pursued two such options outside Rwanda, prosecutions through the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which I'll refer to as the ICTR, and prosecutions in foreign courts. The man on this slide is Colonel Theonest Bagasora, who is the military commander of the genocide I'm proud to have worked on his prosecution at the ICTR, which successfully ended with a conviction. Domestic actors employed two other methods within Rwanda, prosecutions by ordinary domestic courts and gachacha. In Kenya Rwanda, gachacha means the grass or the lawn, referring to how proceedings occurred outside while participants and observers sat or stood on the ground. Prosecution has been both praised and criticized as a means of addressing transitional justice. Proponents of prosecution argue that trials promote stability, the rule of law and accountability, and that they deter account uh, atrocity crimes. Prosecution advocates also contend that ensuring due process legitimizes convictions and imposing stern sentences appropriately punishes the convicted. Yet this option may be relatively expensive and slow and involve politicized or frivolous charges. Prosecution may also result in acquittal or release of genuine atrocity perpetrators, which can lead to embarrassment and more critically, recidivism. The four transitional justice mechanisms used to address the genocide against the Tutsi mark a watershed in the development of international, foreign, domestic, and local transitional justice, respectively and they each have boasted achievements. I'll start with the ICTR, which was the ad hoc court created by the UN Security Council to prosecute suspected perpetrators of the genocide against the Tutsi. The ICTR was officially established on November 8th, 1994 and formally closed on December 31st, 2015. As an aside, it's, it's a fascinating coincidence of history 
that transitional justice for both South Africa and Rwanda was initiated in the same year, 1994, and yet each embarked on quite different paths. The ICTR embodied a more retributive justice approach, whereas the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission represented a more restorative justice method. Both options would become models of the versions of justice they exemplified. According to the United Nations, during the ICTR's 21 years of operation, it held 5,800 days of proceedings, indicted 93 people, issued 55 first instance and 45 appeal judgments, and heard from 3,000 witnesses. By its closure in 2015, the tribunal had sentenced 62 defendant, defendants to terms of up to life imprisonment, acquitted 14 suspects, referred 10 individuals to national courts, and referred three fugitives to a, res, to a residual mechanism. Of the remaining four individuals, two died before judgment and indictments against the other two were withdrawn before trial. Whether the ICTR fulfilled its mission has been a source of controversy since the tribunal's formation. Critics charged that the tribunal was consumed by nepotism, mismanagement, incompetence, inefficiency, waste, and insensitive treatment of witnesses. They also assert that during the 21 years of its operation, the ICTR spent too much money, expended too much time, and occupied too many staff members for the completion of too few cases. Critics also argue that because of the ICTR's location in Tanzania, rather than in Rwanda itself, and what many viewed as an ineffective outreach program, many Rwandans were unaware of the tribunal's existence and progress. Others contend that the ICTR imposed sentences that were too lenient given the egregiousness of the crimes. Overall, the critics charged the ICTR did little to help Rwanda's justice system, brought a meager number of genocide to justice, issued punishments that were too light, and did not sufficiently deter the commission of atrocities elsewhere in the world. Proponents of the ICTR, some of whom concede errors, assert that the enormity and complexity of the task before the ICTR necessitated a significant budget large staff, long timeline, and the selective investigation and prosecution of suspects. They point to the ICTR's successes as helping establish a historical record of the genocide, incapacitating extremists, and officially acknowledging the genocide itself and the suffering of victims. Defenders of the ICTR also note the significant legal precedents generated and other contributions to international law and justice that the tribunal made. In contrast to the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals, as well as the UN International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, all of which addressed international conflicts, the ICTR was the first international court to have jurisdiction over atrocity crimes committed during an internal conflict. The ICTR was also the first tribunal to receive a guilty plea for genocide from former Rwandan Prime Minister Jean Kambanda to impose a genocide conviction on Jean-Paul Akayezu, former mayor of Taba commune in Rwanda, to indict and subsequently convict a head of government for genocide, again, Kambanda, to clarify the definition of rape in international law and hold that it could constitute genocide in the Akayezu case, and to pass a genocide conviction of journalists on three individuals I previously mentioned, Jean Bosco Barayaguiza, Ferdinand Nahimana, and Hassan Ngeze. The ICTR's proponents ultimately claim that the tribunal, despite its limited mandate and resources, contributed significantly to accountability, reconciliation, and peace in Rwanda and promoted atrocity deterrence more widely. These achievements, the ICTR's defenders argue, are important even if they haven't yet entirely manifested and will have been realized only in conjunction with other efforts such as Rwanda's national and local justice systems, including Gachacha. The second transitional justice mechanism for Rwanda that I'll briefly discuss is prosecution by foreign courts, often invoking the controversial exercise of universal jurisdiction. Some foreign countries have sought to hold accountable in their domestic courts, suspected genocide there found within their borders. To date, courts in at least Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland have held or are considering holding such trials. As an alternative to prosecutions, 
for alleged conduct during the genocide. Some countries in which suspected genocidaire seek refuge have tried those individuals for lying on their immigration applications about their whereabouts and activities during the genocide. For example, since 2012, three Rwandans here in the United States and just the New England region were prosecuted for obscuring their connection to the genocide when seeking asylum. All three, Prudence Katangwa in 2012, Beatrice Munyanyenzi in 2015, and Jean Leonard Tagania just last year, were convicted of making such false statements. The third transitional justice mechanism I'll discuss is prosecution by Rwanda's ordinary courts. Towards the end of 1996, Rwanda's ordinary courts initiated prosecutions related to the genocide two years earlier. By the end of 20, 2002, the Rwandan courts had tried approximately 8,000 suspects with an estimated 9.5% sentence to capital punishment, 27.1% to life imprisonment, 40.5% to prison terms, and 19.1% were acquitted. In 1998, the Rwandan government publicly executed 22 individuals convicted by the Rwandan courts of genocide-related crimes. Even though death sentences would be imposed in Rwanda until 2003, these 1998 executions were the last actually carried out. The Rwandan government abolished the death penalty on July 25th, 2007, which among other things paved the way for the ICTR, which was otherwise barred by its own rules of procedure and evidence from doing so, to transfer cases to Rwanda. Like the ICTR, where, fu where fugitives from the Rwandan justice system have sought refuge abroad, the Rwandan government has requested compliance with arresting and extraditing suspected genocidaire. Some foreign states have complied, while others have not. Even after the Rwandan government began prosecuting genocide offenders in 1996 in its ordinary courts, the government was unsatisfied with the pace of these trials. Reviving and revising Gachacha was thus an innovation born out of necessity. Rwanda needed to address its backlog of genocide cases. The post-genocide Gachacha courts originated from a traditional system of conflict resolution in Rwanda that was used by communities to promote, among other things, reconciliation, among the families of antagonistic parties. After 1994, Rwanda decided to use Gachacha not only to deal with genocide cases, but also to rebuild the country's social fabric. In 2001, the, gov the government enacted legislation establishing Gachacha courts. Approximately 260,000 judges were elected to preside over these courts. One commentator refers to the proportion of these elected judges relative to the country's adult population, which was about 6% at the time, as perhaps the largest experiment in popular justice in modern history. The Gachacha process officially operated for 10 years from 2002 to 2012. In its report presented at the official closing of Gachacha, the Rwandan government stated that these courts had tried almost 2 million cases, convicting 86% of the, of the defendants. My colleague, Phil Clark, underscores the scale of the Gachacha enterprise with his observation that nearly every Rwandan adult participated in Gachacha in some way, either as a witness, defendant, or by attending weekly hearings. He characterizes Gachacha as, quote, the most comprehensive post-conflict justice program attempted anywhere in the world, end quote. Although imperfect, the four main transitional justice mechanisms used to address the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, the ICTR, foreign courts, Rwanda's ordinary courts, and Gachacha, have helped combat the rampant impunity that pervaded Rwanda before, the, before 1994 and helped pave the way to the genocide. Given the amount of cases prosecuted overall, the genocide against the Tutsi is sometimes referred to as the most judged genocide in history. Still, the work these four innovative transitional justice bodies have accomplished is not yet complete. Suspected genocidaire remain at large. Tagania's conviction in Boston just last year for immigration fraud is a stark reminder that identifying and bringing genocidaire to justice is an ongoing imperative and challenge. Justice isn't only evaluated on quantity, it's also assessed by quality. As I mentioned with the ICTR, regardless of how many cases have been addressed, 
serious criticisms have been raised about each of these four transitional justice mechanisms. And so we must evaluate these mechanisms nature, not just their numbers. Although imperfect, these forums have sought to change or one in culture of impunity to one of accountability. Despite such wide ranging efforts, full justice after genocide is impossible. Even while promoting accountability and deterrence, we must take to heart that nothing will ever truly make up for such unimaginable loss. A fourth lesson is about, is that sexual abuse is rampant. Hutu genocidaires deliberately used rape and sexual mutilation as tools to spread HIV AIDS, torture and terrorize women and girls, intimidate men, re uh, reduce procreation among Tutsi and destroy the Tutsi population. The UN Special Rapporteur of the Commission of Human Rights in, 19, in 1996 stated in a report about the genocide that rape was the rule and its absence the exception. Some commentators have concluded that as many as half a million women, including almost all surviving female Tutsi, suffered sexual assaults during the genocide. Given the widespread systematic nature of such abuse, the ICTR defined rape in international law for the first time in history and developed the rape as genocide jurisprudence noted previously. The Me Too movement has emphasized how prevalent sexual abuse in the United States, South Africa, and elsewhere is too, even in a non-genocidal context. The Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network estimates that an American, an American is sexually assaulted every 92 seconds. As in Rwanda, such offenses demonstrate the rampant objectification and exploitation of and aggression towards women and girls that persists throughout history and across societies. We must do more to prevent and punish such crimes, including by prodding would-be bystanders to act instead as upstanders, individuals who help others in need. A fifth lesson is that women's representation is crucial, recognizing that women were targeted during the genocide against the Tutsi and should play a significant role in reconstruction and reconciliation Post-genocide, Rwanda instituted a 30% quota for women in elected office. Soon, Rwanda more than doubled that minimum. By 2008, women had won 56% of seats in the parliament's lower house, including the speaker's chair, resulting in Rwanda becoming the first country in the world to elect a majority women parliament. Five years later, women attained 64% of seats in the same parliamentary chamber further cementing Rwanda's status as the world's leader in the proportion of women in a national legislature. In contrast, in 2008, uh, excuse me, in 2018, Rwanda became only the second country in Africa after Ethiopia to feature a gender balanced cabinet with women holding 50% of ministerial positions. In contrast, the same year that Rwanda achieved 64% female parliamentarians, Women held only 18% of seats in the US House of Representatives and only 20% in the US Senate, leaving the American legislature ranked 80th in the world for women's representation. While a, record number, while a record number and percentage of women now serve in the US Congress, the proportion still trails the equal ratio of women in the country. Given reports about the benefits of women's political leadership in Rwanda and elsewhere, including the United States, especially for initiatives to combat violence and foster gender equality, the United States, South Africa, and the rest of the world should follow Rwanda's lead in promoting a greater role for women in government by identifying, recruiting, training, and supporting more female candidates. A sixth lesson is that genocide education is necessary. This is, of course, a lesson that is close to the heart of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center as education is one of the center's primary missions. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it, the adage warns. Not only is it shocking how many people are ignorant of even basic facts about genocide, including the Holocaust and the genocide against the Tutsi, but it is thus also perilous. As it has been 25 years since the genocide against the Tutsi, given the youth bulge in Rwanda, like in other developing countries, 
Millions of people today, even inside the country, were unaware of the atrocity crimes as they occurred. For young and old alike, genocide education trains individuals to recognize threats of genocide and perhaps to prevent such crises. Genocide education can also help combat genocide denial. The United Nations Security Council has specifically condemned denial of the genocide against the Tutsi and endorsed genocide education as a means of preventing such offenses. My colleague, genocide studies scholar, Dr. Gregory Stanton, identifies denial as the final stage of genocide. He describes how denial lasts throughout and always follows genocide. And he warns that denial is among the surest indicators of further genocidal massacres. To combat denial, Stanton recommends two measures, justice and education. In my country, at least 11 states have already mandated some form of genocide education, and legislators in over a dozen other states have pledged to do so. Some states even offer awards specifically for genocide education to praise and promote such teaching and learning. In addition, a U.S. Congressperson has proposed a federal law that would create a grant program at the U.S. Department of Education to give teachers resources and training to instruct on genocide lessons. A third option to combat genocide denial, which is not mutually exclusive with justice and education, is to criminalize such rejections of truth. Over a dozen European countries and Israel have mandated that some form of genocide denial is illegal. Many of those laws focus on the Holocaust. In April of last year, Belgium, which colonized Rwanda and exacerbated tensions between Hutu and Tutsi, in part by distributing ethnic identity cards, broadened its Holocaust denial law to include any genocide recognized by an international tribunal, including the genocide against the Tutsi. The chief prosecutor of the UN International Residual Mechanism for International Criminal Tribunals, the successor to the ICTR and the UN International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, proposed an international law that would similarly criminalize denial of crimes recognized by international tribunals. Proponents of these laws contend that genocide denial is a type of hate speech that insults victims. Supporters also assert that the laws help combat discrimination and prevent further violence against historically targeted minorities. But civil rights advocates argue that such laws violate rights of freedom of speech and expression. Other opponents believe that the laws do not work and that they turn violators into martyrs. Given the egregiousness and persistence of atrocity crimes, genocide education should be required everywhere. Whatever approach among justice education and criminalization is taken, the point is that denial, an essential component of all genocides, including the Holocaust and the genocide against the Tutsi, must be vigorously and rigorously refuted. A seventh lesson is that political will is vital. As with Jews, Armenians, and others targeted for genocidal slaughter, the world abandoned Tutsi in their greatest time of need. It wasn't the world's superpowers, the United Nations, or Rwanda's neighbors that stopped the genocide against the Tutsi. Rather, the Tutsi-led Rwandan Patriotic Front, commanded by now President Paul Kagame, pictured here, ultimately halted the atrocity crimes. Since 1994, the international community has developed more infrastructure, laws, norms, and technology to combat genocide. In 1998, 120 states around the world adopted the Rome Statute, the treaty underlying the world's first permanent international criminal tribunal, the International Criminal Court, which entered into force four years later. In 2005, the UN General Assembly unanimously adopted a resolution, the 2005 World Summit Outcome, part of which declared the responsibility to protect or R2P doctrine. South Africa, the United States, and all other signatories pledged to defend their own people and through the United Nations, foreign populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. Incidentally, uh, Johannesburg has been the, had been the site three years earlier of the related plan of implementation of the World Summit on Sustainable Development. 
In 2004 and 2008, respectively, the UN itself created special advisors on both genocide prevention and the responsibility to protect. Individual states have also beefed up their infrastructure. Soon after the genocide against the Tutsi, the US government established offices throughout the executive branch that focus on atrocity crimes. In 2012, US President Barack Obama issued a directive declaring that, quote, preventing mass atrocities and genocide is a core national security interest and a core moral responsibility of the United States, end quote. Over the past several years, satellite and other technology has improved detection of atrocity crimes. But we must not believe even for a second that these and other developments in infrastructure, laws, norms, and technology are sufficient to prevent or even mitigate genocide. First, each advancement is controversial and some are weak or flawed. For example, the invocation of the responsibility to protect doctrine has been criticized as pretext for military aggression and colonialist intervention. Second, political will remains vital to preventing and, and stopping genocide. That crucial ingredient in the genocide prevention formula remains elusive. Conscientious citizens around the world must demand that our representatives and the international community meaningfully counteract genocide. An eighth lesson is that supporting survivors is fundamental. The, the damage wrought by genocide physically, emotionally, and financially is unfathomable. After the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994, survivors required basic needs, such as food, water, and housing. A 2008 survey found that 35% of survivors between 25 and 65 years old reported mental health problems. Such harm isn't just limited to direct survivors. Studies show that genocide trauma can be intergenerational. The UN General Assembly has recognized the attention that the international community should pay to genocide survivors. In 2005, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution proclaiming basic principles and guidelines on the right to a remedy and reparation for victims of gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of international humanitarian law. This resolution urges the international community to support measures to ensure the safety physical and psychological well-being well -being and privacy of such victims and their families. It also articulates victims' rights to remedies, including access to justice and reparation for harm suffered. Like with other forms of justice, full restitution for genocide is impossible. Indeed, those, these uh, post-genocide objectives can be interrelated. An emphasis on retributive justice for genocide may come at the expense of survivors' other reparative justice needs. With compassion and respect for their dignity, human, human rights, and autonomy, we should help genocide survivors heal and rebuild as much as possible through providing physical and mental health services, housing, economic compensation, access to justice, and other programs. Non-governmental organizations such as genocide survivors funds facilitate such assistance. However, these groups require additional support, such as direct donations from governments, the development and humanitarian aid sector, the private sector, and concerned citizens around the world. A ninth lesson is that upstanderism is imperative. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. declared, man's inhumanity to man is not only perpetrated by the vitriolic actions of those who are bad, it is also perpetrated by the vitiating inaction of those who are good. Such bystanderism enables atrocity crimes. This is incidentally the subject of my current research and next book. Like all other genocides, including the Holocaust, the genocide against the Tutsi featured instances of rescue and resistance. An individual who engages in such conduct is increasingly, increasingly known as an upstander a person who speaks or acts in support of an individual or cause, particularly someone who intervenes on behalf of a person being attacked or bullied. Rwandans and foreigners, men and women, Tutsi and Hutu, and Muslims and Christians engage in such defiance rather than compliance. For example, the only American who reportedly remained in Rwanda during the genocide, missionary Carl Wilkins, 
is credited with saving hundreds of people, mostly children. A pilot study in 2010 of a small portion of Rwanda found 372 rescuers during the genocide. Some scholars estimate that there may have been thousands throughout the country. Ibuka, meaning remember in Kenya, Rwanda, the umbrella organization of genocide survivor groups in Rwanda, has honored rescuers and ceremonies and has given them cows, cows, a symbol of high esteem in the local culture. We must study and raise awareness about such upstanders and doing so could facilitate a more correct and complete record of the crisis, promote reconciliation and healing after the tragedy, help express a, survivor's communi a survivor community's gratitude to upstanders, bolster the legitimacy of accountability for wrongdoers, improve understanding of how upstanderism occurs and may be supported, and help identify possible model behavior. A tenth and final lesson is that never again is an unfulfilled platitude uttered again and again. My fellow genocide prevention scholars and practitioners almost always end anniversary reflections like this one by invoking never again. I will as well, but not in the way the phrase is usually used. Never again is typically employed to declare that humanity will no longer permit the deliberate targeting of a group for extermination. But given that genocides have continued, this pronouncement has proven insufficient. Genocide has persisted since Armenia, since the Holocaust, since Cambodia, since Rwanda. Just a year after the genocide against the Tutsi, genocide was perpetrated in Srebrenica. Since then, genocides have been committed in Darfur, and against the Yazidi and Rohingya. We have no reason to believe that genocide won't recur. In fact, some scholars predict that climate change will increase the likelihood of genocide as groups compete for scarce resources and land. So drawing from the previous nine lessons, I invoked, I invoked not, never again differently. Never again must we take hate speech lightly. Never again must we think preventing or stopping genocide is impossible. Never again must we allow impunity for genocide. Never again must we fail to combat sexual abuse. Never again must we decline to promote women's political representation. Never again must we disregard genocide education. Never again must we permit political unwillingness to address genocide. Never again must we neglect genocide survivors. Never again must we be bystanders to genocide. And never again must we declare never again unless we remember and implement these lessons. Thank you, Murakozi, once again for the honor of speaking to you today. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Zach. Uh, there are some uh, questions. Um, so let me read to you the first question from um, Aisha Kaji. Why has the US not uh, promulgated similar legislation with regarding Myanmar, like the Syrian one and Elie Wiesel one? Thank you for that, um, that really important question. You know, unfortunately, um, you're absolutely right that there aren't uh, as many specific legislative or even policy references uh, to, to Myanmar, uh, where we know um, that, that a genocide has been committed against the Rohingya minority population. Um, me, uh, I, and other um, of my colleagues um, have been lobbying uh, the US government um, to do precisely uh, what you're proposing. Um, unfortunately, as we all know, uh, the Trump administration uh, isn't as concerned um, with human rights as some of its predecessor administrations. Um, my hope is that in the hopefully near future, uh, things will change um, and we'll get back on track focusing on uh, human rights and atrocity prevention, which will hopefully provide an opportunity um, to pursue legislation and other policy making uh, regarding uh, Myanmar. Um, just, I think it was yesterday, uh, Vice President uh, Biden, uh, of course, now the Democratic uh, candidate for the presidency uh, and President Trump's uh, lead opponent, um, 
did characterize uh, the atrocities against the Rohingya as genocide, um, thus indicating uh, perhaps that an administration that he would lead if he wins um, would be more open to focusing on that particular conflict. So um, the question, the next question is again about Myanmar and it is from uh, Mei Zintao from Myanmar. And she's uh, saying, as everyone know, that uh, Myanmar is in transitioning period. Peace talks with several armed groups are ongoing. Uh, for example, the fourth union peace conference finished recently and some agreements made under the third union accords. What I would like to know is under peace talk, uh, should transitional justice take place in the process according to the seven decades of militarization, human rights violations to the people in conflict zones? Uh, if transitional justice uh, uh, continues, what process should all stakeholders take responsibility for? Um, thank you also for that uh, incredibly important question regarding Myanmar and its future. I'm of the view, um, which not everybody is who, who focuses on this field, that transitional justice is and should be highly context dependent. Um, I mean, we can look, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, um, at Rwanda and South Africa as examples uh, of countries and societies um, that took remarkably different approaches to transitional justice. In Rwanda, we had more of a retributive justice approach focusing on prosecutions. And in South Africa, um, we had a uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission that embodied more of a restorative justice approach. Some say that the way that a conflict ends is one of the predictors of how transitional justice will uh, be formulated afterwards. So in Rwanda, just like after World War II, there was a decisive military defeat. That led to a full range of options being possible, including retribution against um, the, the losers uh, of the conflict. And some people characterize this pejoratively as victor's justice, but it indicates that the victors, the winners of the conflict, um, had a, uh, a much wider ambit to decide which transitional justice options to impose. In South Africa, on the other hand, there had been a military stalemate between the pro and anti-apartheid uh, factions. Um, and so some people um, believe that that constrained uh, the options that South Africa had uh, in front of it um, to um, something that would be uh, more acceptable um, to the, the losers uh, of the conflict. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which did not, which operated in the shadow of prosecution, but did not, did not itself um, prosecute, um, was viewed, uh, especially by the losers of the conflict, um, as a much more palatable uh, approach than, um, than prosecution. Similarly, in, in Myanmar, um, as, as you pointed out, there are, there are peace negotiations that may limit uh, the, the, the full range of availability of transitional justice options, particularly retributive justice options. Um, the hope, of course, is that accountability uh, is still pursued um, and that survivors, um, survivors' needs are, are addressed, but um, it's unclear, you know, for now, how that will ultimately be embodied. Um, we have uh, Dr. Ephraim Zurov uh, from Israel that, um, of course, is the chief Nazi hunter uh, at the Simon Wiesenthal Center, saying passing laws is obviously important, but we currently face laws passed by democracies, for example, in Eastern Europe, which support a blatantly false narrative of the Shoah, of the Holocaust, in countries like Poland, Lithuania, and Ukraine. Um, and he, uh, th he would like your opinion about that. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zaroff, for, um, for posing that question and for being here um, today. Uh, I'm an immense admirer of both you personally and the Simon Wiesenthal uh, Center. So thank you so much um, for all the amazing work that you do. 
Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing this. Um, there is an increasing anti-Semitism uh, in Europe, as well as, by the way, the United States. Um, and in some of the ways that we're seeing uh, that discrimination embodied is, is laws that are obscuring, as you note, in Poland, for example, uh, the history of, of the Holocaust. So Poland, for those who are less aware, um, has been uh, in, in, in recent years uh, characterizing itself more as a victim rather than what was true, uh, a collaborator um, during, uh, during the Holocaust. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, this is a terrible uh, um, development um, that reflects uh, increasing um, autocracy and discrimination uh, in Europe and elsewhere throughout the world. And my hope uh, is that uh, in the future, uh, and we must all, I think, play a part uh, in, um, in fostering this, um, that such ignorance, such intolerance, such discrimination uh, reverses course. Thank you. Um, from the United States, Gladwin Lehman is asking, is first of all, thanking you for a remarkable uh, lecture and asking, are there any studies on the attitudes and social relationship between Hutu and Tutsi today? So it's, it's a tricky topic, uh, and thanks for raising it. So since the genocide, um, Rwandans, including, including government officials, have been very sensitive um, about the idea uh, and discussion of, of ethnicity. Um, you know, sort of recognizing that ethnicity uh, has been exploited um, for much of Rwanda's history to violent ends. Also, uh, ethnicity in Rwanda, in some ways, is totally nonsensical. Uh, Hutu and Tutsi intermarried for uh, centuries, share a similar, uh, similar culture, share the same language, um, traditions. And so many of the markers of what actually distinguish ethnicities, many would say, don't actually really apply uh, in Rwanda, including didn't, didn't apply much uh, in 1994. Um, it was the Belgians who had introduced the idea that, that Tutsi are tall and slender and that uh, Hutu are shorter and stouter and used that to issue ethnic identity cards. And just to show um, how ridiculous uh, these theories were, which incidentally, um, some of them uh, related to, uh, to Nazi theories uh, of, of uh, eugenics and biology um and other pseudoscience um sometimes uh rwandans of the same family were characterized as some of them being hutu and some of them being tutsi even even siblings um which is you know further showed uh how ridiculous um the uh the the, the tags were the characterizations uh were um so today there's a lot of sensitivity uh about um ethnicity um, there's very much been a campaign to, um, to have Rwandans think of, them, think of themselves as Rwandans rather than not particular ethnicities. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of where we are uh, at the moment. There is less focus on continuing uh, differences and, or divisions um, between uh, Hutu and Tutsi. Um, than there is about a focus on, um, on, on Rwandans more generally. I should also hasten to mention, because they're so seldom uh, discussed, that there is a third ethnicity uh, in, in Rwanda um, that's often overlooked, and that is the Twa. Um, they're a pygmy, pop, a pygmy population uh, in Rwanda that has also suffered terribly. Um, they suffered terribly during the genocide uh, against the Tutsi, and, and beforehand. Um, and I just wanted to mention them because they are a third um, uh, significant uh, ethnicity in, in Rwanda that, that too few of us study and, um, and pay attention to. So um, Janine and T, I, I will try my best. Uh, Ntihira Geza is asking about the Congo. I mean, what, what less, I mean, those are great lessons, but what is happening uh, at the DRC? 
Um, so thank you for that question uh, about the Congo, about DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, which uh, just like the Twa uh, population in, in Rwanda is too often uh, overlooked. Overlook. From 1998 uh, to about 2003, um, there were somewhere between 3.5 and 5 million people uh, who died uh, in the Congo, mostly related to atrocity crimes. Uh, for those who are less aware, DRC, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, is the, um, the country that's immediately adjacent to the west uh, of Rwanda, so it shares a natural border, the, the Virunga Mountains. Um, and many of the, um, the Hutu genocidaire uh, who perpetrated the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda in 1984 fled westward into Congo um, and sort of uh, set up um, shop there uh, and reformed um, militias, some of which have, have re-attacked uh, into Rwanda in the years uh, since. Um, and, you know, it, it, is, it is a horrible tragedy that, that um, DRC has suffered um, many, many types of atrocity crimes over the years, resulting in, in incredible numbers of deaths, and some also characterizing uh, as genocidal. Um, my hope uh, is that um, the world pays more attention to, to DRC, just as it, it should and must uh, to Myanmar. Uh, to, to return to a topic we were discussing earlier. Um, all I can say is that, that I and, and many of my colleagues uh, here in the U.S. and elsewhere um, who are, are greatly concerned with the situation in, in DRC um, continue to try to lobby our representatives um, to be more impactful uh, on, on, on the country. Um, you know, one of the challenges of, of DRC is its um, size. It's an enormous country, and much of it is unfortunately basically ungoverned. Um, effectively, the eastern part, the part that abuts Rwanda, um, is effectively ungoverned. Um, and that's part of the problem that is continuing to permit atrocity crimes to fester. Uh, in the uh, in the country uh, with with no accountability, um, so I, I hope that the future uh, brings more attention and solutions um, to DR Congo. Uh, but you're absolutely right um, to raise uh, attention to it uh, in this context because it's it's so woefully overlooked. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a, a large uh, community from the DRC in, in South Africa in at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, we work uh, very closely with, with the community. Carolyn uh, Slifkin is asking uh, about genocide education in Rwanda. Can you just maybe reflect a little bit about it? Yes, um, I, I, you know, genocide in, in many ways uh, pervades much or all of society uh, in Rwanda today. Many of the successes um, and amazing achievements in education, technology, healthcare, and other fields in Rwanda is directly related to uh, a motivation to prevent recurrence of genocide and to learn lessons of um, cohabitation, tolerance, acceptance of, of strangers and people of supposedly different uh, ethnic groups. Um, and so genocide education is an important aspect of, of Rwandan uh, culture today. Um, you know, there are, there are few uh, places in the world um, besides Israel, Rwanda, uh, the Balkans, today, Cambodia, uh, today where, um, you know, the, the memory of genocide isn't, isn't more present. It, it, it is so uh, pervasive. Um, so many people in Rwanda are, you know, who continue to live in Rwanda are survivors. Um, and had direct personal experience, just as we're having, you know, we have a waning, a waning population, unfortunately, of Holocaust survivors uh, in the world today. Um, so the genocide education is, is taken seriously. Um, and, you know, one thing that I'll, I'll maybe add about this that's interesting, and I think needs to be emphasized more often, um, is the importance of, of self-reliance. Um, so Rwanda, of course, is, as I mentioned in my remarks, is crucially aware, painfully aware 
of the fact that it was abandoned in its greatest time of need by the United Nations and everyone else in the world. Um, and so Rwanda has very much taken that to heart um, to uh, develop um, policies and infrastructure um, in its own country so that it doesn't necessarily have to rely on other countries to help it um, in further uh, times of uh, internal conflict if they, should, if they should occur. I also should note that uh, Rwanda is one of the lead contributors um, of peacekeepers uh, to the United Nations. Um, and, and that's part of the sort of lessons that Rwanda has learned and implemented about genocide education and genocide prevention um, that we all uh, can and should do more uh, to be helpful. And so Rwanda is literally putting skin in the game um, to, to do so. Um, so bottom line is genocide education is incredibly important uh, in Rwanda and, and is so in, in a, a, a humongous diversity of ways. Thank you. So, so maybe I'll connect that, Zach, to, um, to a comment by Uma Isic, a colleague and friend from Bosnia. Uh, and she says the genocide education in Srebrenica isn't, uh, isn't still possible in the schools in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so your presentation is very useful for me and my Bosnian colleagues. She's thanking you, but it is quite interesting because it is 25 years since the, 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 you know, the genocide in Srebrenica, we just marked it a few, few weeks ago. Uh, and maybe you can reflect on those two side by side, especially about the importance of teaching about genocide in the country where the genocide happens. So thank you, uh, Uma. I'm, I'm, I'm very troubled and sorry to hear that genocide education isn't possible uh, in schools in, in Bosnia -Herz and Herzegovina. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned in my remarks, you know, we're condemned to repeat uh, the, the, you know, mistakes of the past. Um, my, my hope would be that genocide education would be um, and will be uh, possible in uh, about Srebrenica in, in, in throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, all I guess I could say is that I hope that you and your colleagues continue to advocate uh, for it. Um, it's a crucial aspect of, um, of the, the Balkans history. Um, and, you know, because the Balkans was the flashpoint of, uh, you know, two world wars as well as uh, genocide in the, in the 1990s, um, you know, violence is, 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 has been such a, a component of the fabric of, of Balkan society um, and must be addressed. Um, so I, I would hope that, that you and others um, will be able to, um, to finally be able to um, bring genocide education to, to the Balkans. It's understandable, of course, why there is resistance. Just like in, in Rwanda, there are those who, you know, want to obfuscate. They want to confuse. Uh, they want to deny. Um, but as I had mentioned, denial, you know, is the last stage of genocide that, and it often leads to recurrence uh, of genocide. Genocide education is one of the best, um, most effective uh, remedies for combating uh, genocide denial. Um, so again, I, I, I really just hope a time comes and soon um, in the Balkans uh, for genocide education to be possible. So Zach, I'll, I'll ask the last two very quick questions. Uh, Susan Harris is asking uh, uh, about the ICC and does the ICC have any role to play in prevention of genocide? Not of punishment, but prevention. Um, thank you, uh, Susan, for that question. Um, it's unclear, I think is probably the, the best answer. Um, there have been some studies that suggest that perhaps on the margins, um, in, certain, in certain limited situations, the International Criminal Court's mere existence um, could, per, could potentially deter uh, atrocity crimes. The problem is um, that the International Criminal Court um, only pursues, first of all, um, a handful of uh, suspects from any particular atrocity crime. The first chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court for whom I worked Luis Moreno Ocampo um, always said that 
uh, he, he envisioned that the ICC would only perpetrate, would only prosecute at most about 10 or a dozen people from any particular atrocity. And as in Rwanda, Myanmar, uh, DR Congo, um, there are thousands um, of, of such people. And so one could reasonably conclude if you were a, a, an atrocity perpetrator that even if the ICC were to be um, focusing, were to focus on my country, I might still, and actually statistically would likely get away with it, at least from the perspective of the ICC. The other problem with the ICC is on, um, it's extremely limited in how many countries and which countries it can address. Um, so there, there are complicated reasons that we don't have time to get into today um, that limit the, um, the geographic jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And so any state that is outside of that jurisdiction, again, uh, any atrocity perpetrators in them would, could r rationally conclude that the ICC could not affect them. And so therefore the ICC is not uh, uh, a deterrent uh, mechanism. Um, and then even for the countries that are in its jurisdiction, um, the ICC has been very slow uh, and limited in its, uh, in its prosecutions. Um, and so even if you are in the jurisdiction uh, and, the, and the ICC uh, hasn't announced uh, investigation into that country, um, you might still yet again rationally conclude that the ICC will not affect you. Um, so depending on your view of the International Criminal Court, um, either uh, it is too hamstrung in its design and powers um, to be able to be a, a very effective deterrent mechanism, um, or it is appropriately uh, limited and constrained um, and an unfortunate byproduct of that um, is its um, inability to deter. So the last question, because our time really is running out, uh, is from Jacques Ndong, and it's an interesting question. He's saying, if there were other powers involved in the genocide, let's say France, uh, you know, did, in what way did it influence the genocide? And then post-genocide, how do you then uh, punish in any way other forces that get involved in, in genocide? Um, so thank you for that, that question. Um, there is no question of if other countries were involved in the genocide. The answer is that they were. There were some, and thank you for mentioning uh, France. So the way that certain countries were involved in the genocide, I, I re-mentioned uh, the role of Belgium in um, creating and exacerbating through issuing identity cards, which were then used during the genocide to differentiate Hutu and Tutsi so that uh, genocidaire knew whom to kill. Um, the Belgians uh, um, exacerbated those, uh, those tensions and provided a mechanism to differentiate. So that's, that's Belgium's role. Um, France's role was in some ways more direct and, and recent. Um, France has been accused of arming and training uh, genocidaire. So we have to remember that Francophone Africa um, has been you know, receding uh, in, in, um, in the 20th century uh, and to, you know, continuing to today. Um, the Hutu were more Francophone than the Tutsi, which were more Anglophone. And France uh, reportedly viewed the Hutu um, as important to maintaining its sphere of influence in that portion of the world, um, especially at a time when its influence was being uh, challenged. And so again, the accusation is that uh, France, and, and there are various um, amazing books uh, written about this and articles that, that you can easily uh, Google and, and read, um, France played, played a role. Uh, that is the accusation. The problem, of course, is that France is a powerful country. Um, it has a you know, veto-wielding uh, permanent seat on the UN Security Council. 
um, and is a, you know, uh, a leading economy uh, and democracy in, in the world. So Rwanda's own ability to affect France is extraordinarily limited. It's mostly been limited to um, public shaming and demands for accountability. Um, Belgium, I mean, excuse me, France itself has um, at times over the years uh, declared inquiries uh, into its role, its country's role in the genocide, um, but none of these have, um, have resulted in anything to the satisfaction of Rwandans. Um, and therefore the, the relationship, the bilateral relationship between Rwanda and France has for many, many years been extremely strained. Um, so I'm glad you, you raised this issue because it, it really points us to one of the unresolved issues um, of this genocide and other genocides, which is, you know, what is the role of uh, foreign powers, including great powers, um, and what, if anything, can be done uh, to, to um, promote accountability and justice uh, in those scenarios. And unfortunately, um, the answer because of great power politics uh, is, is that such options are, are tragically limited. And with that, in reality, <laughs> we will have to, to end uh, this very, very excellent and informative uh, uh, talk. Uh, Professor uh, Kaufman, thank you so much for enriching us and, and giving us so much food for thought and, and so much uh, uh, information to digest and, and, and think about. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us and to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center's team for assisting. Uh, we hope that you all continue to support us and join us in next week's webinar. Uh, webinars on the 1st of September, actually, we are moving away from this very uh, uh, serious uh, contemplating on genocide and lessons. And we'll actually look at uh, humor and the Holocaust and have a panel discussion with uh, experts that wrote a new book that came out about laughter after uh, the Holocaust, that will be on the 1st of September at 11 o'clock, our time in the morning, and then on the 2nd of September, uh, we'll have a, a fascinating discussion at uh, 7 o'clock at night with uh, author Daniel Lee uh, about his new book, The SS Officer's Armchair. So we're trying to diversify the talks and offer you as much diversity as possible week in, week, week, in, week out. Thank you very much to everyone. Have a beautiful evening and day. Thank you again, Professor Kaufman, for all your uh, immense uh, contribution. Good night. And thank you to Tali. Thank you to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And thank you to all of you for spending uh, this time together and uh, discussing these really crucial topics. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Goodbye.